Joss Whedon, uh, the writer and director Ooh. of the episode, creator of the show. I guess maybe you know that by now. Um, you probably also know that this okay. entire scene I shot, we used as the last scene in episode 15 as a kind of cliffhanger after a very um, sweet and kind of silly episode. And uh, also used it for the teaser of this episode. Never did that before, but we felt it was a scene that was worth repeating twice. Mom? It's a little hard to talk Mom? during it, um, especially seeing Christine lying there for the first time and hearing Sarah say, Mommy. That line, very clearly written, Mom to Mommy, as she descends into, you know, small girlhood uh, at the thought of losing her mommy. Um, this episode is one that I did because I wanted to show not the meaning or catharsis or the beauty of life or any of the things that are often associated with loss um, or even the extreme grief, some of which we do get in the episode. But what I really wanted to capture was the extreme uh, physicality, the extreme, the almost boredom of the very first few hours. I wanted to be very specific about what it felt like the moment you discover something, uh, you've lost someone. I think we're just about ready for bye. And then I'll be pretty much ready for barf. Xander! Gross. No, no, barf. Um, and so what appears to many people as a formal exercise, no music, scenes that uh, take up almost the entire act, if not the entire act uh, without end, is all done for a very specific purpose, which is to put you in the moment, that moment of that sort of dumbfounded shock, that airlessness of losing somebody. Now this scene I put in specifically, artistically rather, because... Um, I wanted to see what they had and happier times and, and to see Joyce. Now, I made a mistake. I put Joyce in the kitchen at the top of the scene. I should have had her coming back all during this and taking dishes away so she was a constant present in all their lives. But, of course, I didn't think of that until after the show had aired. But it was an indication of how things were great um, and some of the fun of what the show is like. Also, for a more and more practical reason, I knew I had to have these opening credits, executive producers and whatnot, and I couldn't. Bear the thought of having them over the shot that's about to come, the, the long take of Buffy first uh, dealing with the body. So I added this scene to be the exact length of those credits so that um, I could get them out of the way. So it had a practical application that led to an artistic decision that I think, uh, you know, is really useful. It's lovely to see Christine and Sarah together um, having the fun. As long as you two stay away from the band candy... I'm cool with anything. A little even flirt moment with Giles, like it's it's life goes on. It's very mundane, but at the same time, it's it's very very sweet, uh, well, without hopefully being overly sweet. And then it's this. Now this shot. Now this shot. This is a this is one long take. And it bears watching exactly how long it is, especially because Alan Easton, the cameraman, had the camera on his shoulder the whole time and was running around with Paul Thoreau pulling focus on, you know, a shot that just seemed never to end. And it wasn't a steady cam. He had no harness uh, because I wanted that. The urgency of handheld, you know, that you're in the moment of it. And... Um, so he kept recreating frames and recreating frames. And this is a very difficult thing to do, kneeling down, getting up. It was an extraordinary piece of camera work. And, of course, an extraordinary piece of acting from Sarah, where I made her do this about seven times. To go from the extremity of first finding her, the helplessness of not knowing what to do. All of the things that Sarah had to go through in this, she had to go through many, many times. And, you know, every, every take was, uh, was extraordinary. This coming up, the rib cracking uh, experience. Again, this is part of what you'll see a lot of. 
in this uh, episode, which is sort of almost obscene physicality, a little more physicality than we necessarily want or are used to. Uh, that expresses itself periodically throughout. Um, because death is a physical thing. There is a body. Um, and uh, apart from the sense of loss that you inevitably feel, there is the fact of the body. And, um, and dealing with that is, is an experience that um, it really does kind of stop time. We have several instances in this scene, in this act, where Sarah, or Buffy, looks out the window. Um, she goes to the back door. She goes to the front door. She looks out the window. She hears noises, but we never show a POV. We never show. We never shot the street outside or the backyard or anything, because again, it's almost unreal. This is the shot for people who don't know what a phone is to explain it. No, again, it's. To me, that's the moment she realizes her mother's dead. It's just fixating on something Hello? almost meaningless. And I thought the phone was the thing. And that is the first cut uh, in the entire scene was when we cut to the phone. We had to use a special lens and, and it was very difficult to get the phone feeling that, uh, that real. Again, here she comes to, to look out, but all we hear is noise because we are completely in her space. The rather arch camera work there as a way of saying, oh my God, I for a moment had almost forgotten she was there. And then again, unlovely physicality. The idea that uh, you know her mother's underwear might be showing is, is, is gross and, and, and upsetting. Now these guys, uh, good actors both, you know, were there to be almost noise in the frame. Very seldom did I actually feature their faces. You know, a lot of quick cutting, a lot of um, everything is about Buffy and her reaction to her mom. Um, and she can't really relate to these people as people. Oh, I'm bagging her. What? Filmically, the idea, you know, obviously was that uh, they are a blur to her. No. I mean, there, there, there was a tumor. Uh, this was done in slow motion, by the way, which you can't even tell. I just ramped it, the camera up to 40 frames per second instead of 24, but it didn't uh, really read like slow motion. That was kind of a, an attempt uh, that just failed. Uh, since then, I've learned if, if you want to go slow motion, you have to go a little bit slower. And, well... Everybody loves a happy okay. ending. I'm here. It's a miracle. That's what it is, a beautiful miracle. Good as new. And once again... Thank God you found me in time. Because uh, I don't know anybody who has suffered the panic of a great loss without having imagined it going a different way a thousand times or more. Uh, so what feels like kind of a cruel joke She's on the part on the audience um, is in fact, you know, just a very real moment uh, within the experience of losing somebody is the, no, they're fine. It's going to be fine. Look, it was fine. And then you actually have to come out of the fantasy and the silence is 10 times worse because of it. This is fun, isn't it? Are we having fun? Again, coming out of focus because she's not really, she can't really deal with him. We're actually coming up on one of my favorite shots. It looks like she did die a good that I ever composed, and it's very simple, and and uh, which is this, it's very simply, it's an over, um, where I uh, squeezed her in the frame as much as possible, so that it's like she just didn't have room to maneuver, and then the shot of him talking, which is just his mouth again, you know, just to say, not to call attention to itself so much as to say, this is her reality, she can't. She can't get the big picture. She's not having a normal conversation. You know, a normal over would have been her with a tiny slice of his shoulder. Instead, I let his, his shoulder own the frame. I took his eyes out of the frame to show her experience of literally being trapped, being blocked off from reality. It's an obvious thing. Not great filmmaking, but when I did it on the day, 
when I saw the over and thought, oh, he's a little too much in frame. Oh, keep pushing it. Keep pushing it. Give her less room. Give her less room. It, uh, it excited me. It made me realize that uh, something, you know, not particularly clever but useful could just appear on the day. Good luck. Her saying good luck, um, again, it's like your priorities become so strange. It's like she wants to be polite to those gentlemen. That's not important. And yet... this you don't really want to hear me talking during but you're going to anyway again uh the physicality of throwing up at the same time the you know focusing on the chimes and the window and not going with her not playing it linearly but uh her experience of hearing those chimes and, and of, of feeling that breeze at the same time as throwing up and our experience of a frame that's not quite the norm. Again, this is her looking out, but it's about her face and, and the, the trappedness, hearing life going on, but clearly not seeing it, needing the air and getting none. The show difficult to shoot because there were a lot of there was a lot of walking, a lot of going from place to place. Because again, I didn't want time cuts that let you out of the moment. I wanted to do everything like this, um, you know, step by step, uh, as it would happen. Some time things are truncated. Giles gets there pretty quickly, but um, we all know how small Sunnydale is. I'm waiting. I deliberately kept him far away and her close up. What? I have to tell Dawn. She, she's at school. I'll go there. I'm not sure. This next part, very difficult for Sarah because she had given everything in every piece and we shot this sequentially. For her to get back to that level of intensity, to say that line, the body, and realize what it means that she just called her mother a body, was it was very difficult, and that was my fault because after the first shot, we just went on sequentially. We should have gone straight to that because she was at that fever pitch. And let's you know end with another nice shot of Joyce. Some people began to suspect. Oh, by the way, she blinked here once. It's the only time she did, and they digitally removed it. It's unbelievable what they can do. Christine was amazing. You know, eight days of lying around. And uh, she was an incredible trooper and lovely to be around. How can you say it's not that bad? This is a classic uh, misdirect. We think she's crying about her mother. and In fact, she's crying about the stupidest thing imaginable. He didn't say you were a freak. You know, that was simply to uh, um, show that, you know, you think what's important in life is important until, you know, you're actually confronted with something that is. Uh, I did this shot as a one -er. Because, again, I always, as much as possible, wanted to keep the experience of being in their moment. Even in this little mundane story. What's interesting about this act, I think, is um, this for me was the biggest risk. Because it's, it's not about mom. It's not about what's going on. It's about something we couldn't care less about. Um, you know, will that boy like her? Uh, will she get along in school? These little things. I'm telling a little, you know, teen high school, you know, short story from the point of view of a 14-year-old girl um, when there's a dead person in the narrative. But I think part of, part of what I wanted to get at was the, you know, the complete ridiculousness of that at the same time the importance of it to the person going through it and uh, um, and this act then becomes about later on the revelation of um, the fact that uh, you know the telling this is the only time we actually have to see somebody have to be told and um, so I wanted to spend an entire act building up her life 
before I tore it down. But, you know, for an audience, I don't know. Um, they could easily go, hey, we're bored. Okay. <laughs> what's, where's the, where's, what's going on? And yet, I don't think anybody was particularly anxious to return to the story because uh, it's, it's not exciting or fun. Uh, it's, it's a horrific kind of a, a thing, and, and there's a sort of relief in having this little romance going on instead. It's the incredibly loud sound of me drinking my tea, um, which now you're a part of. You, the audience, have experienced my tea. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't DVD amazing? Thanks. So the idea is basically the nice, cute boy, he wants you. The nice, cute boy, the cute story, the kind of resolution just... Uh, and I liked telling their little story and, you know, how they're in their world and she's being all intense about, you know, the pain she's been through. And, you know, they're, they've got that teen thing of, you know, I'm 14, I'm just too... I'm, I'm too hip for the room. I'm, I've been through so yeah. much, and I just which nicely counteracts, uh, you know, what's actually going to happen. Don't understand Pain. I'm not going to lie. I'm drinking some more tea because they're standing there. Kirstie's got a blab but at, at some point, Kirstie, it's like she thinks I'm so hot. Everybody should just uh, Buffy will appear and change everything. And I'm like. Oh, it should be right when she's at her happiest. She's that would be uh, my signature. Everything's always about clothes. Or Iraq to or Buffy. Now we're out of Dawn's POV there. That is to say, we're not in Dawn's experience the way we have been for the rest of this scene, the way we generally are um, for every act. There's this thing coming in. She's not aware of it. But watch her face when Buffy says her name. So she kept saying, Dawn. She knows. She doesn't know what she knows. She just knows something. In that moment, she gets older. Um, what? Can it All of these cutaways. Her experience is now becoming, like Buffy's, very specific. We hear the chalk. We see the statue. We know everything that's around us takes on a different kind of significance and is almost like a statue because we, um, we know something's going on. Now, this next scene, I shot in close-up, overs, singles, two shots, just every which way I could. I shot this part of the scene uh, on the Monday because I didn't. we were at the end of the day on Friday and I didn't want to put Michelle and Sarah through that at the end of the day on Friday. So we shot the rest of it and then we got to it on Monday. Uh, but on Friday, we did shoot one long shot from outside. Or, um, something went These, as wrong. Uh, you can sort of tell, were shot slightly slow motion. Is she okay? People watching her. Is she? But she's okay. Michelle did but just an extraordinary it's, job. It's every serious. take. And Sarah, too. Every take, every time out, she went to the place, to the extraordinary place. And then, at the end of the day... I decided not to use any of it, and I fell back here into the classroom from using the stuff we had shot on Friday. I realized I didn't need to see Buffy tell her. I didn't need to hear. I didn't need to be directly in the moment that after what had happened here in school, that what I wanted to show was the environment that it takes place in and, and, uh, and not the actual moment. And then, of course, we get to the female body that she's drawing, which is, again, represents a kind of, uh, a kind of physicality, a kind of trying to see the reality of a thing. And, and the teacher talks about just the outline of it and not the thing itself. We start every act with Joyce. And uh, some people accused me of being morbid because we'd shot so much footage of Christine lying uh, dead. But again, the body, this is, what, uh, this is what it's about. Now this we shot on a rooftop. We faked the window and the blinds. I think they're here. To get back on our set. And then, then the rest of it is back on our set. But we wanted, I wanted to tie in the car. Again, I wanted to see the physical reality of the place. And I wanted people to understand that everything was happening simultaneously. So they didn't have that 
that feeling of being let out of what was happening. Everything just takes a little too long. What do you think? And then, of course, there's this. I shot Ali's side of this handheld again because she's kind of frantic. And Tara's side, I kept more static. And Ali's cute uh, in this and absolutely heartbreaking. And this was the sequence that uh, the hardest thing to shoot for me. Not for her because she can do this. I don't know how, but she can just do this. Um, but every take uh, that we did, uh, she made me and pretty much everybody around me cry. The two of them are extraordinary in this. I should wear the purple. The purple. I, I, I think the, the purple. It, it's just that it's so... I don't know. It, it, it I don't even want to talk bad. when I see her like that. I, I get too upset. Royal. I know I'm supposed to, and I will. Royalty. I can't see Buffy at the morgue and be all royal. Oh, I'm the king of everything. I'm better than you. The jokes in this I episode come cool, from the perspective, the ridiculousness of perspective. Um, you know, I went to, you know, nine stores looking for a black tie because I thought I had to wear a black tie to my friend's funeral. Um, and I became obsessive about it. Um, I was like, it's not real if I don't wear a black tie. This contains the kiss, which um, was the first time they had kissed on screen, you know, and instead of doing a big, they kiss on screen episode, but I just stuck it right in the middle of this show, which again, the physicality. We can be there for Buffy. And they talk about being strong like an Amazon. That's, um, that's a reference to the Frank song. It can be strong. Which uh, I don't know if a lot of people got, but it's a song I really like and, and one that uh, I thought would be appropriate. Um, not just because she's gay. Um, again, getting back to the kiss, that's, you know, that's the thing I was talking about where what's real, what's physical is, is, is what I'm attuned to here. Later on, when Dawn says, I need to pee, um, I had her say that instead of I have to go to the bathroom because, you know, I wanted everything to be a little too much. And, of course, we'll see more examples of that because we'll see lots more shots of a dead body of Buffy's mother. Again, hey. to go from the hall to the room physically to see how people... Take yeah. this moment, the various moments that happen in the first few hours. I know the feeling. The, the telling with Buffy and, and Dawn. Um, another reason I dropped back in that Buffy and Dawn scene was that I knew I had Willow coming up, who else was going to be in her face with the tears. And, um, it's a, it's a, it's and to do it with Dawn as well felt like, you know, the same beat. Uh, following a banjo act with a banjo act. Uh, the inevitable high and wide uh, Hitchcockian, we're all tiny and life is terrifying shot. What's going to happen? This was a a, a horror to shoot in the sense of, you know, I had to shoot in four directions and it's an entire scene practically with no blocking. Everybody is just in their spot, um, in their place. And that two was deliberate because you can't really move. And th this whole scene is about their helplessness. They're the Scooby gang. They're supposed to be on top of it, helping out and they got nothing. I have to change. Everybody that I spoke to when I was writing this, natural. I mean, you know, has lost someone, has a story about it, has an attitude towards it, um, and it all fed into this. But a lot of this came from my own experiences of losing my mother and of and of losing other people, and and just not just of my own grief, but of watching everybody else's. And everybody here deals in a different way. Tara deals the best because she's been through it before, which is a revelation we'll get to later. Xander gets angry because. 
he doesn't know what else to do. And we see Tara reacting to his anger and his desire to make it right. We see that specific push in on Tara because, as we'll later learn, this is something she's been through. Willow, of course, wearing her heart on her sleeve and completely um, at, at sea about, you know, the, the clothing Somebody thing becoming a, just something to latch on to. Okay. And then his anger allowing her to be cogent enough to become the grown-up, to comfort him. And, of course, Anya. Anya, her part in this is something that... Uh, most people remember best of all. Damn straight. Because um, she just seems to be Anya, Are we gonna see asking Anya? just horribly inappropriate questions every five seconds. Are we going to be in the room with the dead body? <laughs> Emma's performance here is lovely. No? When she goes into her but I guess we should speech we coming up. What people responding to besides the uh, the performance is the fact of it as a kind of a a plot twist. That is to say, nobody expected that much sensitivity from from Anya. Um, and uh, so when she breaks down and expresses really the heart of the experience, um, the very very basic, I don't understand oh my god would you just stop talking just it uh it moved people Please, uh even more than i had what? predicted yeah. and be partially because it works as a plot twist because you think oh she's just insensitive the way you behave, and then will tell me. Because it's not this okay happens be asking these things but i don't understand i don't understand how this all happens how we go through this. I mean, I knew her, and then she's, there's just a body, and I don't understand why she just can't get back in it and not be dead anymore. It's stupid. It's mortal and stupid. And, and Xander's crying and not talking, and, and I was having fruit punch, and I thought, well, Joyce will never have any more fruit punch, ever, and she'll never have eggs or yawn or brush her hair, not ever, and no one will explain to me why? I was very specific with her about going up on why like a little girl. I wanted that to I wanted that to reflect all the vulnerability of a child. We don't know how it works. And that, you know, gives her a new understanding with, gives Willow an understanding of uh, what she's going through. And again, they're all separate. My wife and I are enormous fans of a little Japanese fella uh, called Burnt Bun Boy. And when I got a Burnt Bun Boy, uh, stuffed Burnt Bun Boy, um, I had to put him in the show. That, of course, is the blue short sweater she's been talking about the whole time, just you know, the life's little irony thing. And then the Burnt Bun Boy cameo is exciting. And the sudden noise Sorry. of, Sorry. rather than, again, showing what Xander has done, just hearing it and seeing the result. Uh, because, again, it's, it's not about the cool action of punching something. It's about the startlement of having somebody punched it or the realization that you just did. So, you know, I had those wide shots of the girls, everybody very much in their own space. And then all of a sudden, you know, you hear this thing and then Xander is apologetic and everything changes at this point in the scene because now they have something physical to latch on to. And they get to become the Scoobies again. Um, the whole thing, and some people didn't get this, which is my fault, but the whole thing of him looking at his hand with the blood and being better when he sees it. Um, again, physicality as a living thing, not just as a dead thing, but it making him feel better, it making them feel like they're the Scoobies again because they had a little crisis to deal with. And Tara understanding that the fact that it hurts is a good thing because it hurts less 
than the other things. So now they can get their their shit together. The other thing about this scene is that um, I believe it was the plaster that Allison was allergic to. But when we shot the part where he punches and she goes up to him, uh, her right eye uh, swelled up enormously. Uh, luckily, I was shooting her left eye, um, so we could get most of what we needed um, done, and then. Um, Deal. Uh, we could shoot the rest well, another day. But uh, she actually had to go to the hospital, um, and they gave her steroid pills and all sorts of things. And we figured it was the plaster because it started to happen again when we went back there. But we didn't know the whole time what was wrong with her. Her face, the, her eye just started swelling up um, at the end there. So we figured later there was a plaster. And, of course, one more beat of, no, wait, I need to change clothes one last time, and then out to getting a parking ticket, again, connecting the physical space and saying very mundanely life going on, uh, not stopping for your grief. Hey, it's Christine again. Now, I have to confess in this next shot that um, I am a huge Paul Thomas Anderson fan and that I had been watching Magnolia obsessively uh, before I shot this. So these endless tracking shots uh, probably owe something to that. Uh, I'm a, what can I say, I'm, I'm a hack. But what I was really trying to get at here was, again, the, um, the reality of the space. I wanted to see Joyce very clearly, and then I wanted to walk all the way over to where Buffy was, where her loved ones were so that you understood she was down the hall, she was really there, she was in a shot with them. It was not a cut. We weren't on a different set. Uh, the, you know, Carrie Meyer and everyone, they did a great job building sets that connected because they knew I wanted that very desperately, so that I wanted to be able to make those connections. These dissolves representing part of the process, again, the sort of the formal version of it. And again, you know, a moment of humor, uh, Emma Caulfield, God bless her, will always give you the moment of humor when uh, no other character seems appropriately uh, to be able to. Okay, I've examined your mother's body. Can we see her? I shot Donnie. Don, not now. I shot Michelle with, no, with a steady cam when I was on uh, a dolly for the rest so that everybody else would be slightly more... Solid than she was, because a lot of this act has to do with her alienation and her feeling of the unreality of it. Buffy has been through the reality. She has dealt with the body. She broke her mother's rib. She called it the body. She went through a very terrifying version of um, a loved one's death. What Dawn is going through, so you see a slight drift there, that's because she's on steady cam. What Dawn is going through is different. What she's going through is the disbelief, because she hasn't had that physicality yet. And of course, the, the inevitable fantasy uh, that will just keep coming back and coming back and coming back. Ah, uh, thank you, Doctor. But Dawn's, Dawn's problem here that Buffy doesn't understand, of course, because she's in her own space, is, is that it can't possibly be real, whereas for Buffy it's all too real. And those are two different uh, experiences, both of which are very common in death. Are you depressed yet? Because um, it's not getting any better. There'll be a vampire later, uh, if, if that's good. We'll be here. I loved the, uh, the lights they had in this place. They, they, they had exactly the coldness that I wanted. There's something almost uh, feels like a Stanley Kubrick frame uh, when I look at that. Um, just because uh, the way those lights are, the way everything is just a little too big, a little too wide, a little too harsh. At the same time, you know, the light is very sweet on the people because they're sweet people. I don't think we're going to have to be here very long. What about... Dawn just unable to connect what and about... Buffy unable to connect with her. Nothing. My experience of death is 
Do you want someone to go with you? That apart from a lot of hugging uh, at funerals, it seldom brings people together. Do you know where it is? Yeah. Uh, it actually tears them apart. And uh, I had always learned from TV that uh, death made everybody stronger and better and learn about themselves. And, and my experience was that, uh, you know, a, an important piece had been taken out of the puzzle amongst my family or friends or whomever it was, and that that piece would never be replaced and that people would never be the same, and that there is no glorious uh, payoff. There are sometimes revelations and lessons that are useful. Um, you have to take something out of it because it's inevitable. Um, none, none of us getting out of here alive. Do you want anything? You know, that's why at this time a lot of people turn to, as Tim Minear would call him, the sky bully. But um, since I don't believe in the sky bully and um, don't really have that to fall back on, I haven't really found any lessons in death other than I wish it wouldn't. We'll come with. We'll be real quick. Their desperate need to help and get food is a classic thing. And the uncomfortableness of being left with the person who you don't really know very well in your moment of extreme grief, who really doesn't want to be there because it's your moment of extreme grief, um, you know, holding this two shot for a long time, waiting uh, a long time before Tara's last line was again, a kind of a plot twist moment. And I held the beat for much longer than I would have normally. It's just an amazingly dumb thing to say. Obviously, I've never done this before. I have. My mother died when I was 17. I was surprised, I will say, when um, people saw this, no, how many I people didn't. actually did gain comfort from it and a kind of catharsis. People. Uh, emailed and, and wrote and said that they had suffered a loss, um, sometimes their mother, um, and that oh, they had either, had. it had either been concurrent with or that it had happened years before and they had never been able to try. deal with it until they saw this episode, which moves me more than I can say. It surprised me, though, because I really was after that feeling when in the first few hours when there is no solution or catharsis or, or anything else. And, and um, just to capture the, those moments and, and um, for people just to see that and to take something from it because it's happening to people they love and understand, I think is, is, is what worked. And that was um, a lovely revelation that uh, just finding a moment yeah. and expressing it yes. and expressing human behavior at this time without, uh, without drawing any grand conclusions about it um, was enough, was enough, uh, was in communicating enough to people that it would give them comfort. Um, that to me is, um, well, it's pretty much why I'm here. Not that every episode that I make is going <laughs> to be this depressing. Um, sometimes we have jokes and all kinds of things on the show. It's really very exciting. <laughs> the long walk down the hallway, different than the walk for the uh, for the um, doctor. For the doctor, it's a completely run-of-the-mill experience. For Dawn, it's a horror. Literally. We're dealing now with death. We're dealing with the reality of her dead mother. And so all of a sudden, what was a very brightly lit episode, too brightly lit, too much light in the faces of people who wanted to be in darkness, uh, turns into what appears to be an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Not much light. The light there is very cold, very blue. Ray Stella, the cinematographer, on this one. 
did a great job with that. Um, and then we color timed it uh, even bluer. Notice how we pulled the sheet down so you could clearly see that was a face. And this is something she needs to do. And other people I know have expressed this need. I need, I can't quite, but I need to know what it is. I need to see it. And then that. That's not helping anybody. Now, some people were like, why a vampire in this episode? But I was very specific about it. Uh, I wanted a vampire, first of all, who looked more like a corpse than anything else. And here's Dawn, young Dawn confronted by not only a vampire, but a naked man. It's, it's an intrusion. It's, it's, uh, it's offensive uh, and completely physical. And that's, uh -huh. that's what I... Uh, yeah. And then, of course, they're so cute with their food. But that's... Um, and believe me, the giving of food is a huge ritual of death. Uh, it's usually not vending machine food, but it often is. I guess. You guys like I'm explaining death, like anybody who's watching this hasn't experienced it. Uh, I'm just explaining why I did that. But the idea of the vampire was partially that it, it is an intrusion. It doesn't belong here. Uh, the way... Tara finds herself being the only one sitting with Sarah and feels she doesn't belong, but then actually has something to offer. You know, the way they're getting a parking ticket. Uh, life goes on, and on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, that means horrible things happen. And this fight was done differently than any other fight I'd done before. I made it as much of a of a gross wrestling match as I could, uh, you know, hands in the face. And then, of course, pulling the sheet off of Joyce, uh, you know, in the worst way possible. But rather than, you know, a great, cool kickboxy fight, I made this, you know, like a genuine struggle. Because, again, I wanted to stress the reality of it and killing the guy. Donnie is getting what she was looking for. Again, she can't quite. The frames are never as clean as we want them to be in this show. See, we really painted him up to look dead. And, and when I kill him again, I do it the worst way imaginable because I wanted uh, to be in your face with it. If I say physical again or, you know, real, uh, you guys are just going to turn this off. So I... I won't. Don. And then we're into the end. This was a very difficult shot. We didn't have room for a dolly track, but we had Bill Brumman, cameraman, uh, steady cam extraordinaire, uh, basically aping a dolly shot um, by walking up onto a ramp so I could get the three shot that I desperately wanted to go from Buffy to Dawn to the three. Oh. The fact of death being physically real and physically unreal is expressed here. Um, this isn't the last shot. It's expressed in the last shot after Dawn says that those words, words that cannot be answered by anybody and reaches out to touch her mother in a show that's been all about physicality. This girl who needs to know, to understand never touches her. And that was done very specifically. Um, and some people said, oh, that means uh, next week Dawn's going to heal her with her key powers. And I was like, what show were you watching? Um, no, it meant we want to touch it, but there's nothing there. And to go out just before she touches her was to express that. To express what I've been talking about the whole way. There is no resolve. There's no resolution. There's no ending. There's no lesson. There's just death. Well, I hope you had a good time. I know I have. Bye.